We are live in Studio B with your day-to-day BYU sports play-by-play. I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. Joining us now is the publisher of the Extra Points newsletters, one of our favorites. It's been a while. Matt Brown is back with us to discuss big things in college athletics, specifically college football. Matt, great to see you. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great, fellas. Always great to spend some time with both of you. Hey, listen, last week in the meetings of the NCAA, we went into them not thinking that it would be, I don't know, that big of a deal, but it kind of feels like it is becoming a big of a deal, and it's only going to become a bigger of a deal as we move forward. So what was your takeaway from last week's NCAA-wide meetings and deregulation and whatnot that was discussed there? Yeah, that's. I think that's a pretty healthy way of framing it, honestly. There, there wasn't a ton of you know, really hard news that came out of that week, unless, you know, you're really interested in Division three schools complaining about revenue distribution, which is a little bit niche, even for my niche newsletter. <laughs> but it really does set the table for um, some really huge conversations moving forward because this new NCAA constitution delegates a ton of authority specifically to Division One. So everything that you think about here in this bylaw and this rule book, what does it mean to be a conference? How is revenue from the NCAA men's basketball tournament distributed? Uh, what, how are we going to split up what it means to be Division One? All of these things are now on the table to be renegotiated and will be over the coming months. Now, it's interesting because there's little little pieces of information that are, are, as you mentioned, the next couple months will be discussed and perhaps decided, one of which is a Power 5 breakaway. Now that BYU is going to a Power 5, it's like, hey, I feel, I guess I feel differently about it. I, although I wouldn't want March Madness to be blown up. I don't know if that's a football-only conversation. What are, you, what are you seeing and hearing? I have not really heard a lot of appetite among Division I schools for a formal P5, G5 complete breakaway. And part of the reason is because of the, of the NCAA men's and women's basketball tournament. And, and part of the reason that event makes a lot of money you know, maybe maybe it's kind of weird to talk about it here, maybe in this market. But part of that is because America loves to gamble on it, and America loves to gamble on it because they want to bet on a Big Sky team or a Summit League team, and not a six and ten Virginia Tech team. So it really does make sense for everyone to have this as a combined event. But one thing that you are hearing a lot throughout these these conversations are P5 leaders saying we want more autonomy. And they already have autonomy to do basically everything that they want. So when you hear someone say, we want more autonomy, what they mean is, we want more money. And I think that that's going to manifest itself in a pretty different NCAA tournament over the coming years. That might mean that the unit payout system is different. Maybe it goes away. Maybe it increases. Maybe it's added for women's basketball. Maybe the tournament expands. Or maybe we get rid of the automatic bid uh, system. So maybe uh, only the certain certain low major or mid major conferences get automatic bids, and more of those go to power leagues. Which, if you're BYU and you care about basketball, maybe that's something you actually like because the Big Twelve is an extremely difficult conference, and it's about to get more difficult. Maybe you would want a system where you know, hey, if I finish tenth in this league, I'm probably still going to make the tournament. Yeah, wild to think about. Matt Brown with us on BYU Sports Nation. You mentioned more money. The Power 5 schools specifically are at the front of that. Does that mean more money for the student-athletes with the emergence of name, image, and likeness, in your opinion? Well, it, it, it definitely is. The question, I think, is going to be what mechanism you know, uh, forces that. Because we have, uh, there's a couple of things all happening at once. We have the name, image, and market name, image, and likeness marketplace blowing up. That's helping athletes at BYU. It's helping athletes at UVU. Athletes all over the all over the country. And that's, I think, independent of anything that happens with this changing constitution. You also have the federal court system and like not just liberal judges, but really conservative judges, too, saying maybe we should take a look at these assumptions we've had about amateurism. Maybe if somebody is working 35 hours a week for an enterprise that makes 11 gajillion dollars in television <laughs> revenue, maybe they should be considered employees rather than, you know, warrior poet student athletes or whatever the designation is right now. And so that might mean... Maybe that means we have unionization. Maybe that means they become direct employees. And a program like Utah or BYU or USC may be better equipped to navigate that system than maybe somebody like Southern Utah or, uh, or, or Utah Tech, right? So, you know, And those are questions that the NCAA themselves can't totally navigate. It's going to depend on what the courts say. It's going to depend a little bit on what Congress says. And I know that stinks because if there's one thing I know college football fans in this market love to hear, it's... We can't wait to see what Congress is going to do. But that's part of what <laughs> the reality is right now. 
Uh, look at you dropping uh, Utah Tech and and Summit and Big Sky. Ah, you you know the audience. That's very that's very good. Okay, um, so you just talked about it. Are we gonna are we going to have a pay for play situation where it's just straight up like amateurism is is sort of gone? Like yes, you you're you're paid to do like that's up in the air, right? Like that could happen if they wanted to because they have a new constitution. Yeah, that that is something that I think is is a possibility. Everybody has to grapple with. You know, I remember I was talking with uh, with Bubba Cunningham, who's the athletic director at North Carolina, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and out in Las Vegas. And I posed this question to him, and he said, "Yeah, this is something we're talking about. And if that world happens, UNC is still going to play college sports. The, the question for us is how we're going to pay for women's lacrosse or swimming or some of these other sports. But whether they're employees." Whether there's uh, whether it's through NIL, whether it's something else, somebody is still going to wear the, the baby blue jersey and play basketball at the Dean Dome. Um, but if you're an AD right now and you're not thinking about, well, is this system going to stay the same in five years? What happens if the courts say we have to pay people? What happens if there's a hybrid? You have to at least think about it. I, I bet if we went into Tom's office right now, there's going to be a lot of spreadsheets somewhere that's you know, forecasting what would we do if the Supreme Court then says X in 2025. Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports joined us recently, and he is of the opinion that with the separation potentially happening, especially financially between Power 5 programs that are naturally just going to get more money because that's what they do compared to some of these lower-tier Group of 5 teams, that some sports are going to be cut. Matt, do you see Group of 5 teams cutting sports moving forward because of the discrepancy in how much money is distributed between Power 5 programs and some of these lower-tier schools? Yeah, you know, I, I think most of them won't have to, but I can definitely see a world where they'll decide to do that. And, and one of the things I think that's important to think about for G5 programs or mid or low majors is that they sponsor some of these other sports for different reasons. You know, thinking back to, you know, not far where I grew up in, in Ohio, you have schools like Youngstown State that want to sponsor lots of programs, even if they're not even going to sell a single ticket, because they want that, they want that tuition money. They want, they want to boost their enrollments, and they realize, hey, if I have a swim team, you know, most of those athletes aren't going to be on full scholarship, um, and then they can give us some tuition because we can't even get butts in the, in like, in the school right now. That's not the world where BYU is. That's not the world where, where Utah is. But even if there's a, prof a professional model, I think you'll see plenty of mid-majors, low-majors, and G5 programs that are trying to boost enrollment, maybe even add sports rather than drop them. Other schools are going to look at this and realize it makes more sense for us to invest this money into football and basketball. Um, and I would say if you care very deeply about collegiate tennis, you should think about other ways that that system could work because it may not be able to be sustainable with what we're doing now. There's so much money in this game, and it's going into the pockets of certain schools right now. Is it inevitable? Well, it already is competitively. There's a, a massive gap competitively. Like, wh where is this headed um, you know, if you're if you're San Jose State or Western Michigan in having football, but not actually competing at the highest level. Right. And even a team like BYU that is not on the same level as Alabama and Georgia. But who is? You know what I mean? And, and Clemson had an off year. But who knows? They'll be back soon when they find the next Trevor Lawrence or whatever. Um, wh where yeah, is this headed? One does. I mean, I, I joke with people that I'm like, if my crystal ball really worked, my newsletter is going to be a lot more of an eight bucks a month. Like you, <laughs> you, you, can, you can put me on retainer, right? I think if you're a Western Michigan or a San Jose State, you have to have some, some difficult and uncomfortable conversations about what success looks like for your athletic department. If, you're gonna, if, you're, if your department gets together and says, listen, the only way we're going to balance this budget, the only way we can do the things we want to do is if we go eight and four and make the Arizona Bowl, well, you need to either come up with $20 million more million or you need to, to get out of the game and, and do something else. And there's, I think we could probably think of a couple of Division I schools that maybe are fooling themselves a little bit and pretending that they're playing the same sport as Alabama or honestly even playing the same sport as, as Cincinnati, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's not what Louisiana Monroe is doing. That's not really what UMass is doing. But if you, have your, if you define success differently, maybe it doesn't matter that you're never going to beat Alabama or anything. I mean, I, I think BYU fans would agree, hey, we had a great season last year. We had a great season the year before that, even though we were never really in the race to win a national championship. It's, it's a different system. And I imagine there's going to be some significant reconfigurations in college football over the next couple of years, and maybe Eastern Michigan and Western Kentucky are playing in a different classification. But it just, it, it's, it just depends on 
how you really value success. And this is a different sport than the NBA or anything else because success doesn't necessarily mean, mean winning a title. There's a lot of fun football, a lot of fun basketball that's played every year that has nothing to do with what happens in the college football playoff, I think. Matt Brown, publisher of the Extra Points Newsletters and College Sports Insider with us on BYU Sports Nation. Everybody has an opinion these days, Matt. So knowing what you know and having traveled to these meetings and spoken with athletic directors and high-level people at different universities, what do you think is the recipe for success overall for college sports to still maintain some integrity, be competitive, and be appealing to fans? That's, that's a great question. And and I I may be a little bit different, I think, from some other reporters because I don't think we ever really had amateurism. I don't think that this system ever really was completely competitively fair. People have been cheating since 1905. Like <laughs> Yale had bagmen. Princeton had bagmen. The schools that don't even exist anymore were, were you know, going into the, the local steelworkers hall and just grabbing anybody <laughs> off the floor to come play left tackle. So like I don't I don't look at this with any illusions here. I, I think I think what's important big picture is that the all this money that's coming into this system is is distributed in a way where the people who are doing the most work uh which i think are the athletes get either long-term health care or or some other kind of financial protections i don't think it's fair for a coach even at a bad team a team that's going to finish in last place in the sec west to make seven million dollars a year while the left tackle is one knee injury away from potentially losing everything yeah. and honestly i think a lot of fans really agree with that too that the, the pro sports are set up the same way. There's enough money to go around. There's enough money to go around, I think, to support 100 plus FBS programs. It's just a matter of figuring out how to share it in a way that uh, allows the most possible people to participate. And that's not something really American sports do very well. Uh, and I hope that maybe we can find a way to do that a little bit better in college football moving forward. Matt, fantastic stuff. For those who don't know, how can they find more of your content? You can find Extra Points at extrapointsmb.com. It's a newsletter that covers business and educational and administrative stories that shape college sports off the field. Uh, you can get it for free, uh, two uh, newsletters a week, or you can get a paid subscription to get everything. That's extrapointsmb.com. Fantastic work, my friend. Thanks for the time. We'll talk to you again soon. Always, always good, fellas. Thanks for having me.